Good evening, everyone and all the attendees. Welcome to uh, the second virtual grand rounds of 2020. My name is Shannon Strader. I'm a fourth year medical student at Lincoln Memorial University in Tennessee, and I am this year's AADMD virtual grand rounds facilitator. For those that are new, virtual grand rounds are a webinar based presentation model that creates a space for mentorship and exchange of knowledge and experience between seasoned IDD providers providers, entry-level clinicians, and future healthcare providers in training. The purpose of the Grand Round sessions is to expand and strengthen the IDD healthcare workforce across the spectrum of experience levels. After this meeting, we'll be sending out a survey monkey on feedback for feedback on how to improve these meetings. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you may write your questions on the sidebar and we'll go over as many as we can as time permits. And we'll be sending out Dr. Robinson's email if you wanna get in contact with our speaker tonight. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our amazing speaker, Dr. Robinson. Dr. Robinson joined the Lee Clinic in 2014 and has spent much of her career improving the lives and addressing the medical needs of patients with IDD. Prior to joining the Lee Specialty Clinic, Dr. Robinson served the United States Air Force as a flight surgeon and family physician. Honorably discharged, Dr. Robinson moved to Virginia where she worked in private practice for some years before moving to Kentucky in 93 with her husband, a Louisville native and her family. Dr. Robinson has worked both in hospital and private practice settings in Kentucky. The mother of a child with IDD, she serves on the advisory board for the University of Kentucky study on aging with Down syndrome. Dr. Robinson is a member of AADMD and has spoken at numerous conferences for healthcare providers caring for patients with IDD. A board certified family physician, Dr. Robinson graduated from the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine in Oklahoma City, and she completed a family medicine residency at Duke Area Health Education Center in North Carolina. And from my personal experience from uh, being able to work with Dr. Robinson and learn from her. She's one of the most amazing uh, holistic family medicine physicians and does a great deal to help our uh, favorite population. So thank you so much for speaking tonight. I'll, I'll give it to you, Dr. Thank you, Shannon. It's a real pleasure. Um, welcome everyone to the AADMD Virtual Grand Rounds, and thanks to Shannon for inviting me to do this. And I'm just going to ask you one question, Shannon. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. All right, thank you. And I'm just going to say one thing about that bio. The residency program I graduated from was known as the Duke AHEC in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So not the same thing as the Duke Family Medicine Program. Just want to make sure everybody knows that. So my talk today is on overcoming barriers in the medical assessment of persons with neurodevelopmental disabilities. And I'd like to lead off with my acknowledgments um, right up front because working at the Lee Specialty Clinic has been where I learned 95% of what I know in the field of neurodevelopmental disabilities, if you discount being the mother of a child with essentially Batten's disease, 20-year-old, um, he's also a patient at the clinic. But the Lee Specialty Clinic is an interdisciplinary clinic that was started by Dr. Henry Hood, Dr. Matt Holder, and Dr. Phil May, who are my mentors in this field. And Going back just a few years, if I may, Dr. Hood and Dr. Holder actually authored a uh, paper with Barry Waldman back in 2009 called Preparing Health Professionals to Provide Care to Individuals with Disabilities, in which they surveyed deans of medical schools, deans of dental schools, and directors of residency programs. And they discovered that while the deans of the dental schools and the medical schools felt they were preparing their students adequately to care for individuals with, with disabilities. The majority of the graduates disagreed, and both the um, directors of the medical and dental residencies felt that their residents were ill-prepared to deal with individuals with disabilities. 
So Dr. Hood and Dr. Holder, um, over a circuitous course over several years, put together this um, interdisciplinary clinic. And I had the good fortune to stumble across them in their first year of being open, 2014, and never looked back. It has been a real pleasure to work with these doctors. And uh, I, I will say that the AADMD owes part, partly owes its existence to Drs. Hood and Holzer. So barriers to medical care is something that we're familiar with as people who work with persons with disabilities. And I'm going to try to concentrate primarily on barriers to assessment, although it's kind of a gray zone in some ways. So medical care is a system that was designed a certain way to have to take a certain input and to provide a certain output. And of course the input is the patient and the output is the health care or medical care that's provided to that patient. So to the extent that the health care encounter in a particular venue, whether it's a doctor's office or a hospital or an urgent care center or an ER, is designed around serving the neurotypical patient, then you can consider the neurodevelopmentally disabled patient to be sort of a non-standard input. And to the degree that the system is or is not flexible in handling the non-standard input, you may have a, a suboptimal output, which is poor health care. Now, I am fortunate enough to, li to but live and breathe and work in a system that is designed around the needs of the disabled person, the intellectually disabled person and the neurodevelopmentally disabled person. But I realize that, number one, that's unusual. And number two, we are an experiment. And so we didn't get it right from day one. And we're still trying to find new and better ways to overcome the difficulties that the patients and the providers have meeting each other in this system. So a medical system has several components, several moving parts, of which, of course, the provider is one. And we think of ourselves as the main component, but you know, maybe we're not. The healthcare team, which is your, your personnel that are around you helping you deal with the patient, and keep them safe and keep you safe, and I'll talk about that more later, the physical plant, which is the building, and of course, accessibility is just one of the many considerations when you're dealing with neurodevelopmentally disabled patients. You're talking about not just accessibility physically, but do you have an environment that they can tolerate? Is the noise level something they can tolerate? Is the light level what they can tolerate, and so forth? Then you have the law and regulatory language, and I won't go into that, and the funding, and all of these parts of the system in most of the healthcare venues that are out there, they're all oriented toward the typical patient. For example, the law and regulatory language, um, the, the need for a guardian, the need for a spokesperson is, it, something the law doesn't quite mm, recognize as a barrier to care, but in some instances it is a barrier to care. And we have, I'm not going to go into it, but here at the Lee Clinic we've been trying to figure out ways to assist patients with decision making when their designated decision makers are remote, not available, or unconcerned with their care, which happens sometimes, I'm sorry to say. And then the et cetera, that, that more or less deals with the parents, the guardians, and uh, other people who are giving care to the patient who may be considered an input to the health care visit, or in some instances when they're very well trained and experienced, they may be part of the system itself, which I know that sounds strange, and I'll go into that more later. I'm going to basically be building my talk around several case studies 
And these are amalgams of patients I've seen, and they do not necessarily represent one single individual patient. But I thought this would be an easy and sort of fun way to introduce some of these concepts. So I'm going to start with Adam. And Adam is a 30-year-old Hispanic male with intellectual disability. So looking at that sentence, I'm wondering if you have a mental image of what this person is like. And I'm thinking probably not, but this is probably the way you'd be introduced to the patient in a typical progress note coming out of an ER or coming out of an urgent care center or somewhere like that where, where patients are seen at a high volume. But in fact, the important thing to know about Adam is he is unusually tall and strong. He is big. He understands some words, seems to. He does not talk at all. He's very afraid of doctors, hospitals, and medical offices in general. And he has a history of aggression towards his caregivers and occasionally towards strangers in public places. Some things set him off, such as loud noises. Other times, it's not clear what set him off. So he's, he's a difficulty. So one of the things that you want to do when you're the primary care provider for a patient like Adam is you want to make sure that whoever gets his medical records from you knows those challenges, knows what the barriers are to this patient. So if a, if a patient can talk, if he can't talk, if he can understand what you say, if he cannot understand what you say, not always the same thing. Adam can understand some things, but he can't talk. You want to put that in your note. You want to put in your note if they're dangerous to the provider, if they come in with a good caregiver, if they come in with a negligent caregiver who, who may not warn you when things are about to get serious. So that's why I say my first point, or help out the next provider, do your due diligence. Write down in the note what they need to look out for. So when we get this call from the caregiver about Adam, we learn um, that he has a remote history of testicular torsion, that he was not treated. He was evaluated but not treated because of his aggression and because of the fact that he was felt to be a risk to pull at his stitches, to open up his wound, and therefore he was sent home without prescription pain medication. This was remote, mind you. But if you're thinking this happened in some remote location, no, this happened in Louisville. So, and now Adam is having behaviors. He's being aggressive. He's uh, trying to hurt his caregiver. Several days ago, he was having a behavior in his home. He tripped, he fell, he landed um, on his buttock or hip. And since then, he's been walking differently, and he's been moaning as if in pain, and he's been mean, where he previously had been used to his caregiver. So what are the barriers to assessment? Taking this phone call, of course, the initial barrier to assessment is that the provider, that's me, is a little bit afraid of Adam. Adam is big and strong. Another barrier is Adam's fear of providers and medical situations in general, his inability to give a history, his refusal to come in the building sometimes, and his becoming aggressive, especially when he's approached to be examined. So here at the Lee Clinic, we have a CBA. Um, he's a great CBA. His name's Steve Foreman, and he's a past president of the Statewide Association. That's a community behavioral analyst, by the way. It is a special field that is very, very useful and, and very necessary for patients with behavioral disorders, which includes autistic patients, but other patients as well. And Mr. Foreman's role here at the Lee Clinic is to help us in situations just like this, where we have an individual who may become a risk to personnel or to themselves. So with his help, we designed a plan to see Adam at the end of the clinic day when no other patients would be around and no, no other caregivers so that we would minimize the risk to others. 
We had Steve and two trained technicians present to ensure safety. And these technicians, by the way, these are not um, ABAs. These are not behavioral technicians. These are actually um, assistants in the, the dental clinic who have been trained by Steve to help out in behavioral situations and also trained in how to ease people into the papoose for dental care. So, so they're very experienced with large people like Adam. So Adam comes in the building, he's walking around in the hallway and he's scared to go in the room and we're not going to try to get him into the room. He has a very kind, very skilled caregiver with him who's able to partially remove his clothing, telling him that he's going to check his briefs and we're able to from a distance of some six or eight feet, examine or look at the pelvis and legs, and that shows hip ecchymosis, suggesting some dissection and some swelling. And we can see that as he's walking around, he's limping and he's favoring one leg. So at this point in time, given his history, which is not new and probably doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on his injury, but still, given the fact that he is obviously in pain, we're going to need imaging on Adam. Now the problem is he will not go to an x-ray suite in a hospital. He will not go into a hospital. So what we did, we ended up summoning EMS and between the EMS personnel and our staff members and our behavioral analysts, we were able to get Adam onto a gurney and then contact the emergency department physician and explain the situation the remote history, the studies we think that needed to be done, and the fact that he would need sedation because of behavior. So my second pointer in regards to Adam is that we, the primary care provider or just the provider on the spot at the time, we need to be the bridge to the higher level of care. And that does not just mean telling them he's coming because he may get there and they don't know him and they don't get him off the gurney you know, they, they don't see him walking around necessarily. They may or may not x-ray him. And they may send him home. They may send him home without pain medication and he may need pain medication. He may need more than that. He may need surgery. He may need stabilization of a fracture. So one thing that we try to do is to engage the, the ED physician not only in the cognitive aspects of the case, but as much as possible um, to create a link, to create a personal link to the patient. Obviously, if one provider calls another, then the provider receiving the phone call is more likely to take that seriously. They know that there's someone interested in the care of this patient. The past history of torsion can be and actually was used to gain some sympathy from the ED physician so that they would see this person as someone who had suffered in the past from people who had neglected their care, so to speak. And then CT scan of the pelvis was recommended. He needs a CT to rule out fractures and soft tissue trauma. He's going to need sedation for the CT. In a way, that gives permission to the ER physician to do what they probably would have felt like they needed to do anyway, but might have had second thoughts about because it's not really standard to sedate a patient for a CT. But in this case, it was absolutely going to have to happen. And then the expectation being made that if something is there that needs to be treated for pain, we expect him to be treated for pain, obviously. So Adam did have a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with a pubic symphysis diastasis and a coccygeal fracture. We think they were both new, but we're not 100% certain, of course. Um, he is ambulatory. There didn't appear to be any other soft tissue damage, so he's discharged to home with opiates for a few days and his schedule is reduced, and there's no demands on his activity, and he has no further episodes of aggression during his recovery. So what were the alternatives for the caregiver if, if we had not done that? Well, one option would be no care at all, and there's a risk that untreated pain would cause continued aggression, and obviously there's a risk that something serious would have been missed. Another option, the caregiver calls 911, EMS comes, they're not able to get him on a gurney for transport, they see he's walking around, and they say, sorry, we can't help you. We know of people that that's happened to. Um, 
What if the caregiver had taken Adam to a doctor's office that wasn't familiar with, with him or his situation? It's doubtful they would have gotten him out of the car. The provider would not have been able to examine him. The provider would probably have told the caregiver to take him to the ER or call 911, which we know probably would not have worked. And then fourth is caregiver drives Adam to the ER. He refuses to go inside. Caregiver asks the ER doctor to go out and sedate Adam, probably with ketamine. We've seen that used. And that does occasionally work, but it doesn't work all the time. And more often than not, it doesn't work. The, the ER physician is not going to come out into the parking lot, usually, to see the patient, not to say they shouldn't. And if you're that ER doctor, you probably ought to give it a thought, because sometimes that is the only way to get somebody into the ER. So I'm going to go on to another uh, case now, and this is Bailey. Bailey is an 18-year-old Caucasian female. She has severe intellectual disability. She's a very sweet person. She has some language in the form of very simple words and occasional two-word phrases. But she is very, very shy and very scared of strangers in medical situations. And you'll find that's a pretty common theme. I don't say all patients that come here are anxious, but if you want to think about how you feel going into a doctor's office, you know, and then multiply that because it's hard for them to understand what's going on sometimes. Her presenting complaint is insomnia. She gets up at, uh, in the nighttime and wanders. Lately, she's been a bit more irritable. She's been crying off and on, refusing her usual activities. She's even had some food refusal. She bats at her ears. Uh, Bailey's one of these people that she will hit her ears if she's upset, if she's scared. And again, if she has an ear infection, she will hit at her ears also. When Bailey comes in, one of the first things I ask is about her teeth, because when it comes to hitting the head or the face, that is always a concern for me. Patients who draw attention to their face I'm not going to say usually, but often have periapical abscesses. Um, they have, you know, serious erosions. They have dental problems and gum problems that cause them pain and cause them to have food refusal and sensitivity and basically be unhappy. She had seen her local dentist recently. This is a dentist that's known her all her life. She's very comfortable with them. They did x-rays and found no problems. Now, I will say this about x-rays. When, when a community dentist does single teeth x-rays, it won't always show a periapical abscess. And so we recommend that they have the full extent of the teeth in the form of a panorex at least once a year. Um, but but their dentist is taking care of her, and she's, they feel like she's fine on that score. So barriers to assessment, she's very shy and anxious. She cringes when approached for the exam. She's obviously afraid of white coats. She's afraid of medical equipment. She's just afraid of the, of the exam room period. So next pointer is don't make anxiety worse. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes here and just talk about how people feel when they're out of control in a situation that is unfamiliar to them that they associate with prior instances of traumatic experiences or pain, things of that nature. Even if you're a neurotypical person, if all those factors apply, you're not happy to be there. And it is not particularly reassuring when people smile and speak to you loudly and call your name and get up in your face and stare at you to try to make you feel better. These are things that sometimes we do socially sort of reflexively, but we really need to try to do everything that we do deliberately in this situation. So in the situation where you have an anxious patient, probably the first thing you want to do is sit down so that it's obvious that you're not going to be springing forward at them with a needle or something like that. Sit down, and then 
if you've ever watched like the dog whisper or things like that, there are ways that our body language shows that we're a threat or we're not a threat. So turning slightly to the side, I always sit on a, on a uh, rotating stool or a rolling stool when I see these patients. And I, I may try to catch their eye by rocking a little bit back and forth, turn a little to the side so they don't feel like I'm right up at them. And then I may lean forward a little bit. I may look at the floor before I look right at their face. There are so many patients with autism and, and other situations that really react with fear when, when somebody looks directly at them. But yet, because they're slow to respond, people are always trying to get up towards them, like, hello, are you there? I'm talking to you, and you know, may touch them, may get up in their face. But if you will take three or four minutes and let them get used to you being there and talk to them in a low register, low tone of voice, and give them the chance to answer, give them 30 seconds to say something, then you may find their hearing is just fine and they can actually talk. And maybe they will if you give them the chance and if you don't startle them or frighten them. So don't make the anxiety worse. Be predictable. Telegraph your actions. Predictability is a precious thing when it comes to your patient. They need to know that you're not going to be doing anything they don't expect. And it's easy to have that after you've been with them several visits, but sometimes you can't wait several visits. Sometimes you need to have that happen on the first visit. So this is what I do. I tell them pretty much what I'm going to do in summary. I'm going to look in your ears, and I'm going to ask you to open your mouth, and I'm going to have a look in your mouth. I may feel of your neck. I may ask you to raise your arms so that I can feel under your arms. I may listen to your chest. I probably going to ask you to lie down so I can check your liver. I don't usually say feel your belly because that's sort of, mm, it, doesn't, it doesn't give a lot of information and they're thinking, why would she want to feel my belly? But if they realize there's something in the belly I'm aiming for, so I usually say, I'm going to try to feel your liver and then I'll motion it's right over here and I may check your ankles. And if you say these things before you ever start doing anything, kind of run down the list and they'll realize, well, there wasn't really anything on that list that I have a deep problem with. And then as I go to each part of the body, then I will go through it again. I'll pick up the otoscope. Now I'm going to look in your ear, show them the otoscope. I actually flash the light on my hand before I do anything else with it. And I say, I'm going to use this to look in your ear. And then I point the otoscope at my own ear. And I may say it again, I'm going to look in the ear and then I'll point to the ear I'm going for. I'm going to look in that ear. And then I'll approach them with the otoscope. And typically, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 90% of the time, if you go slow, that works. It's not going to work with Adam, of course, but 90% of the time, that works. And then I do that with each body part as I go. If the patient pulls away or resists or withdraws, I may stop, give them a few seconds. I may start over and try again. If I get through two attempts, maybe three, I'm not going to try again on that body part, this exam, unless it's an emergency. So Bailey comes in, and we know that she's very scared. So we're going to take her into our counseling room, which has a sofa in it, and we're going to all sit down in the conference room. And the family, they're primarily concerned about Bailey's ears because she's hitting them. So Bailey is a special case. She is very scared. So we're going to give the family the otoscope to start with. We're going to let them work it, turn the light off and on. We're going to have them shine the light on each other's ears, not, not stick it into each other's ears. This is all being done without the ear tip. And then eventually they're going to look at Bailey's ears and she's going to get the otoscope and she's going to look at their ears. And then the examiner gets to look at Bailey's ears. And believe it or not, that worked the first visit. So that was fun. 
and a brief examination of both ears was successful, showing only impacted cerumen. So maybe that's the problem. Um, cannot get Bailey to open her mouth at all. And we do have a dental clinic here, and it's a wonderful thing, because if I cannot get into their mouth in the medical office, whenever they're over in the dental clinic, that's about 15 steps away from me, and I can walk over there while they have a, a prop in her mouth, and I can get a look at her, at her oropharynx that way. But in this case, I really want to know if there's an infection going on. And so I use the lymph nodes as a surrogate. So I very gently palpate under the chin, the anterior cervical chain, the posterior cervical chain. I'm looking for anything that seems swollen or inflamed or just a lymph node. And there, there weren't any. So with anxious patients, when you go to palpate the neck, what you want to do is you want to take one hand Put it on one side of your neck and say, I'm going to feel your neck. And then, with the same hand, you're going to put it on one side of their neck and feel down one side. People are a lot less anxious when you don't have both hands up on their neck at the same time. And I did mention it, but the Deb rocks. Next time she comes in, hopefully, we'll get a better look if we tell the parents to go home, buy the Deb rocks drops and use for, for patients who won't hold still and let you get the full five or 10 drops in and sit on their side for 10 minutes and let it soak in, which is a lot of them, one drop on each side every single day or twice a day will also help clear that wax out and eventually you'll be able to see past that. But today we did, using the family to assist, get an oral pH on Bailey and it was five. Now a normal oral pH is seven. It's very useful to have pH paper around, and it's gotten to where I try to do one, if not every visit, at least once a quarter on patients, because it is a very easy way to screen for acid reflux in patients who aren't very informative. Her oral pH was five. That's pretty low, not the lowest I've seen. <clears throat> so an oral pH is painless and easy to obtain in most patients. And how I usually go about it is I take two of the pH paper strips in my gloved hands, and I, I tip one into my mouth and pull it out again and show that it changed color. And then I drop that one, and I give the other one to the patient. And I let them get it wet. I say, get this wet, and we'll see if it changes color. And that works, I'm going to say, about three out of, three out of four times. Sometimes they have to know you pretty well to trust you to put a piece of paper in their mouth. If they've recently had food or drink like within the last hour, that's going to confound the test. So, and the rest of Bailey's exam, such as we were able to complete it, was essentially okay. We did start her on acid reducer therapy. It did improve her irritability, food refusal, and night wandering. We referred her to gastroenterology. She did have esophagitis and a small hiatal hernia. She did well for a few months, and then her symptoms came back. On further history, it was learned that Bailey spends most of her time sitting cross-legged and leaning forward looking at a device. And I wish I could say I was smart enough to ask the parents, does Bailey sit cross-legged leaning forward looking at a device? But that is not how that happened. What happened was the parents were educated that anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure, causes reflux. And we went over several of those. And then several months later, they came to me and said, well, does sitting cross-legged leaning forward looking at a device increase intra-abdominal pressure? And I said, why, yes. Yes, it does. And that is how we discovered that she was probably exacerbating her reflux that way. And she had a consultation with our behavioral therapist. and she had some instruction and some therapy on how to sit at a table to use her device, and her symptoms improved once that became a habit for her. So the short take on that is parents can be such a huge resource if they understand what you're looking for and why, and they're worth every minute of time that you invest in them, educating them, because it may take you a lot of time on the front end, but it's going to pay off when 
they're going to be your patient for years and years. So Charlotte, this is a difficult one to talk about because I actually felt like I, I failed to some extent in not diagnosing her problem sooner. She is a 20-year-old quadriplegic woman of Asian descent with no expressive or receptive language. She is in a wheelchair. Um, she has very limited passive mobility of the extremities due to spasticity, but she does have some mobility, some small degree of mobility of the extremities and trunk, head, and neck. She is aware. She watches. Uh, when I come in the room, she looks at me. Her eyes follow me as I move around the room. However, she doesn't appear to respond to instructions at all, and she doesn't appear to have receptive language. Charlotte came in um, with cerebral palsy, seizure disorder from childhood, and a G-tube due to dysphagia that she'd had since childhood. And she's getting all her nutrition and medications uh, in the G-tube. And she had been having what looked to her mom like bouts of acute distress, agitation, thrashing as much as she can because of her limited mobility, thrashing, turning her head side to side, flushing, sweating. These episodes were happening initially once or twice a day, but persisted until they were more frequent, and sometimes it seemed to last all day. She had been to the hospital several times to the ER because of these. She'd been hospitalized three times. Um, usually when she would go to the hospital, it was because of fever and the appearance of distress. So barriers to assessment. She's nonverbal. She can't tell us what she's feeling. She's seen multiple providers in recent months. And so she's had a lot of data, but she's also had a lot of changes to her medications here and there. Records were not initially available, and we had to send for them. Once they were obtained, we saw she'd been hospitalized with aspiration pneumonia on two occasions, once with a UTI. And she had had, she has multiple neurotropic medications, both psychotropic medications because of the agitation. She has seizure medications. One of her medications had been stopped during a recent hospital stay due to low blood pressure. She hadn't had breakthrough seizures after that. It had been a couple of weeks. Mirtazapine had been started. That had been a few weeks. She'd had multiple CTs of her head, her chest, her abdomen. Her chest CTs on two occasions had shown pneumonia that looked like aspiration pneumonia. And each time she would go into the hospital with fever and agitation. She'd get put on antibiotics. Her appearance would improve after a few days. But she would continue to have spells of distress. So. Charlotte is aspirating, and Charlotte is fed completely through a G-tube. So another pointer, visualize the mechanism of pathology. I know this one seems simplistic. Possible mechanisms for her to be aspirating. What do they include? Reflux, that's what we thought she was having. Nausea and vomiting. Inappropriate PO feeding. So the, there may be more, but you'll have to put it in an email to me if you know what it is. No decrease in mental status, continues to make eye contact. She had her teeth evaluated. There was no problem there. She had no ocular clonus, which you would see in serotonin syndrome. She had an oral pH of 6, which, while it suggests acid reflux, wasn't all that bad. Reaction to abdominal exam, very difficult to interpret. So one thing we did was therapeutic trials. And this is one way that we can sort of finesse the diagnosis in these patients, particularly when we feel like the medications may be a fault. Her serotonergic medications were reduced and eventually eliminated, and there were several of them, to see if she was having an adverse drug event such as akathisia or serotonin syndrome with no apparent benefit. She was treated with an acid blocker with no apparent benefit. Ondansetron gave some minimal relief to her agitation, and when we treated her with Ativan, we saw substantial relief, but the episodes did persist. Her tolerance to interval feeds continued to decline. Her bowel movements remained regular and soft. Charlotte cannot report nausea, but over the course of several weeks, had increased gastric residual, and the residual was bilious. 
meaning that more than likely she's experiencing nausea and she is having retrograde propulsion of bowel contents into the into the stomach. So there is a family history of gallbladder disease and one day it occurred to me, well, she's had all these studies in all these hospital stays. I wonder if anyone's ever done a gallbladder ultrasound. So I went back through all of them, and there was no gallbladder ultrasound. Of course, gallstones are radio opaque 20% of the time, and they're not going to show up on, on a CT scan necessarily. Ultrasound's the gold standard. So she had an abdominal ultrasound that showed gallstones, and she went and had surgery. She did very well for several days after surgery. Then she got worse again. She got worse to the point where her surgeon sent her for a CT, found nothing wrong on the CT, felt like she was just having behavior at that point. She came back to me. I looked at the CT report, and it showed a thickened bladder wall. So I'm thinking, urinary tract infection. We did treat her for a urinary tract infection, and she did get better. But that was a long, hard course for Charlotte. And as I said, a bit of a failure on my part. I should have gotten the gallbladder ultrasound early on, which brings me to my next pointer, use diagnostics freely in this population when appropriate. Liberal use of imaging can make up for some of the shortcomings of the history and physical. There should be a low threshold for nonverbal patients for the ordering and authorization of non-invasive imaging. And when a patient can't talk and tell you they have pain, you can use your judgment because you are the provider, you are the physician, you are the person taking care of them. You can say, yes, in my opinion, this person has abdominal pain. In my opinion, this person has abdominal tenderness. In my opinion, this person had nausea based on her reflex and, and uh, the bilious nature of it. So you can, you can use that as a diagnosis. You can get an abdominal ultrasound for abdominal pain. And it, it, you know, it's, it's as true of Charlotte that she has abdominal pain as it would be if she could tell you she did. So moving on to Della. Della is a 50-year-old Caucasian woman with autism, a mild cognitive impairment, and severe OCD. And she has a compulsion to touch people and objects, often in certain patterns or of certain categories. She perseverates in her speech and in, in her actions, and there is a history of purposeful self-injury. Um, she did attempt to cut her ear off uh, at one point, um, but not at this visit. Della comes in with a caregiver who says she's here for a routine checkup. Um, this is one of those patients that lives with a paid caregiver. So as you probably are aware, there are several care settings for people with neurodevelopmental disabilities. They can live in a, a big facility like an ICFID. Um, they can live in a staffed residence, which is a house that has rotating staff so that somebody's there 24-7, maybe with three or possibly even four um, persons with disabilities in the same house. Then there's the family home provider where you have an actual family sort of take in a single patient or sometimes two and give them all the care they would give a family member in the same situation. And then a lot of them, of course, live with their parents or their brothers or their sisters. But Della has a mother, but she's living with a caregiver. The mother is alarmed because when the patient comes in on home visits, she's getting progressively irritable and aggressive toward mom. Barriers to care, Della's unable to comply with instructions due to compulsions to touch objects. She's a risk to herself in the exam room because she's drawn to touch the sharp box and explore it. So we have to clear the room when, when Della comes. We have to have a special kind of sweep of the room. She comes in with a different caregiver each time she comes. Caregivers are regularly reporting challenging behaviors in the residence, but they don't provide data on how many bowel movements is she having, how much sleep is she getting, what's her oral intake. Those sorts of things are important 
And a lot of the caregivers that we see don't take the time to assess their patients in the home. And they come to us with minimal information. So my next pointer is put it on a prescription pad. These residences or these FHP situations, they are obliged to follow a doctor's order. And a doctor can order something on a prescription pad, and it will happen, and you'd be amazed. Um, I have used prescription orders to have sleep charted, to have food intake charted, to have bowel movements charted, to have voids charted, exercise, um, and it works with the family home providers and it works with the staff residences. It typically does not work with the parents because they don't feel like they need to write things down. They know what's going on. They don't have to write it down. But on physical exam, Della's girth has increased. Um, so she has some abdominal bloating, and really you can only examine her stomach standing up. She is not going to sit down or lie down for two seconds together. So getting a sense of her abdomen over time is a little bit more challenging, but you can tell that it's getting bloated, and it can measure, and, and the girth is getting getting up there. So. We measure and record parameters over time to alert us to problems. And those include the weight and the BMI, the girth, the grip strength, the heel bone density, the mini mental status exam, the vital signs, and several other things like the oral pH and the vision screening and so forth. But these are these are some of the main ones. So for Della, I took my own advice and sent her for an abdominal radiograph, and it confirmed constipation. Her behaviors improved with more attention to laxation, so that was a good thing. So Nathan. Nathan is a 50-year-old African-American with mild intellectual disability, schizophrenia, mild cognitive impairment, mild physical impairment, and of course he is afraid of doctors, and he has a history of Sudden, unprovoked extreme violence and a remote history of severe sexual abuse and trauma. He's had insomnia, weight loss, refusal of food, dry mouth, urinary frequency, and increased aggression. Drug history shows polypharmacy. He's not the first one in this series that's come in with polypharmacy, but he, he is on multiple antipsychotics, psychotropic medications, benzotropine for extrapyramidal symptoms, Tepra for seizures. So pointer on this case is consider common sources of morbidity in this population. And the ones that I always fall back on and think about in my mind, infections, adverse drug reaction or drug interaction, constipation or bowel obstruction, dysphagia, which can result in weight loss, which can also result in aspiration, acid reflux which can also result in aspiration. Sleep apnea, which can also result in aspiration because sleep apnea can trigger acid reflux. Abuse, trauma, dehydration, and malnutrition. So Nathan is fatigued. He walks unsteadily, no history of gait disturbance. He's hypervigilant. His vital signs are normal. And my pointer here is to expect an increase in blood pressure in an anxious patient. And why doesn't Nathan have an increased blood pressure? And I was going to go into my lengthy description of how to get a normal blood pressure on an anxious patient when they come in with a high blood pressure and you don't want that number to be the number they go out with. And it's pretty simple. You use a large manual cuff. You tell them what you're going to do before you do it. You tell them it's going to be tight for a minute. And you say, your numbers will be better if you will breathe in and out slowly the whole time I'm inflating and then you demonstrate slow breathing while you're doing it. And that helps you get a really good blood pressure a good deal of the time. But in his case, he had a normal blood pressure. So then we did an orthostatic, and he had an orthostatic drop in blood pressure. We attempted to get a UA to see if he was dehydrated or had a UTI to explain his symptoms. He did have difficulty collecting a urine. We did finally get a little bit. It was unremarkable but a post-void bladder scan, which we are lucky enough to have in the office here, points to urinary retention. I wanted to add this. I feel like it's important. I know I'm rushing because I'm, I'm going over time here, but 
Occam's razor does not apply to our patients. Our patients have multifactorial illness and they should be treated as such. We need to find all the situations that are contributing to their dis-ease. So for example, if they have insomnia, maybe their mattress is bad. Maybe they're taking caffeine and nobody's watching how much. Maybe they're taking medications that cause insomnia. Maybe they have increased intracranial pressure because they're taking a fluoroquinolone. So it's very important, especially on patients with polypharmacy, to consider all of the possibilities, including, and I, I'm sorry to go over, but I'm going to go over. Just today, I had a, a parent bring a patient in who had been switched from one generic manufacturer of Topamax to another generic manufacturer and had a complete loss of control of their behavioral symptoms and broke out in a rash. And when we discovered that that had happened and went back to the first manufacturer, the symptoms all dis disappeared. So you have to consider everything, including have they recently changed drug manufacturers for the same drug. Um, one thing I want to throw in there, make it easier on yourself and your patient to rule out certain things. The things I'm talking about are nutritional deficiencies. I'll try to explain it this way. I hope I won't offend anybody by saying this, but if you think about animals in a zoo, they have a dietitian who's highly, highly trained that puts out, that makes up the food and puts it out for them. And that food is nutritionally balanced in every respect because these wonderful animals in the zoo, they can't forage and they can't go out into the wild and get what, what their body tells them to get, what their instinct tells them to get. So somebody takes very good care to make sure they get what they need. However, a disabled patient in a residence, they may not have somebody watching what they eat or caring what they eat. And they may have just as little access to the sorts of foods that they might instinctually want as does a caged animal in some cases. Probably not all cases, but in some cases. They may not have access. And they may not have the instinctive drive to get the correct nutrients that they need that a neurotypical patient would have. So you don't know if they're coming up to you with a, a minor zinc deficiency or magnesium or manganese or essential amino acids or essential fatty acids. So let's eliminate all the guesswork and let's have everybody take a multivitamin and fish oil. And I don't mean everybody. Obviously, there are some parents that I trust to provide a good meal every day to, to their children, their adult children. But there are plenty of caregivers that I don't necessarily trust, and I will put those patients on a multivitamin and fish oil to make sure that their behaviors, their aggression, their irritability are not being driven by a chronic lack of a certain nutrient that they cannot access themselves. So I probably shouldn't spend a whole lot of time on Carter, and I probably won't. He's, he is a 25-year-old male with Down syndrome. He's a wonderful person. He started to have some anxiety towards strangers. He prefers his routine. That's kind of normal in Down syndrome as they grow older. He's not responding to parents promptly when they call him. They want him to be referred for hearing testing. He's got a lot of seasonal allergies, a lot of upper airway infections, ear infections, cough. He doesn't sleep well. He's been getting up at night to eat. He's gained several pounds. So the parents' concerns can become the focus of the visit in this instance. And the parents' concerns are, are his allergies and his hearing. But Carter is manifesting anxiety, and he's manifesting some of the, the cognitive decline that can start in mid-adulthood in patients with Down syndrome. And that's really my concern, because as a member of the Aging and Down Syndrome Advisory Board for the University of Kentucky, uh, one thing that we have discussed, and there's certainly been no proof of it, but it's been entertained, is the idea that sleep apnea, which afflicts so many Down syndrome patients, may have a bearing on their early dementia. And Carter is fatigued. He refuses the oral exam, 
and I go through my usual routine. I show him the tongue depressor, but I don't make him put it in his mouth. I hand him the tongue depressor and let him hold on to it. And then I demonstrate how to open his mouth. And if he still won't do it, then I use a gloved hand and I tap on his teeth if he'll let me. And if he will let me, I then sweep back to the back teeth. I use an oral pH strip to break the ice. I ask him to stick his tongue out at me. And of course, Carter's tongue is huge and the, the posterior oropharynx is small in comparison. He has macroglossia. His mouth is dry. His oral pH is 5.5. Ears are unremarkable. He has noticeable sighing when he walks down the hall. And one of the barriers you're gonna see is the parents do not want to have to consider the possibility that there's something else wrong. So they don't want to consider sleep apnea. They don't want to do a sleep study. They would rather avoid the whole thing. And so they will say, well, he wouldn't, he wouldn't use the uh, device if he did have it. And they may simply not be aware how very, very, very detrimental sleep apnea is to an untreated patient's health. Not only in terms of fatigue, not only in terms of acid reflux, not only in terms of sleep deprivation, but in terms of pulmonary hypertension and other complications down the road. So I'm down to my last two slides, and I know I've gone over, and I'm sorry. But parents can be a great help to you, or they can be a great hindrance, and a lot of times they can be both, and you just have to build a relationship of trust over time. The, the time you invest in that is going to help you out tremendously as you continue to care for that individual. Sometimes you have to refer to a specialist. Sometimes they won't believe you. You say, okay, we'll, we'll ask somebody else. And then guardian barriers to care I've already alluded to. They're overworked. Some have 80 patients on their, on their census. They will never come to a doctor's visit unless you demand it. But if they are completely unwilling to do what needs to be done for a, for a patient's health, they do have bosses that can be appealed to. And we have gone as far as appealing to adult protective services, protection and advocacy, and the ombudsman services at the state level in rare cases when we could not make an impression on the state guardian about something that had to be done for a patient. So with that, thank you so much for your patience and listening to me. I know I've gone over. Um, and. If there is time, I will take questions if I can figure out how. Shannon, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you for letting me do that. Yeah, uh, you actually have a lot of questions, so I'll just pick out some or hopefully quick answered ones. And then if we don't, for the attendings, if we don't uh, get to your question, uh, feel free to email um, Dr. Robinson or me uh, if you need any help. Okay, so uh, have you had success with picture communication aids with nonverbal patients? Some, yes, and it has been uh, one of the one of the happiest moments I had was when a patient of mine that I knew had been um, working with their speech therapist on a communication device for months, but I had never once seen them use it. Um, and actually, mom was as surprised as I was. I said to mom, can I see how they use it? And, and she said, well, well, he won't, he won't say anything to you. But I had him get out his device. And I said, you know, as if I were starting over the visit, I said, hello, how are you? And he said, hurt. I mean, he used his device to say hurt. And I said, hurt where? And he said, foot? And darned if we didn't take his shoe and sock up and find out that he had a sprained ankle and his mother had no idea. So yeah, it, you should always ask them to bring out their speech device and use it with you. Wow. Um, have you found that one barrier is too tight and rushed uh, with appointment schedules for doctors so that it becomes almost impossible to take the time to proceed in a slow, gentle, and relaxed way? Absolutely. Why I love where I work because they have already factored that into the system here, but I totally understand that. And it was it was hard to to nigh impossible to give the kind of medical care I wanted to give to every patient, not just disabled patients, 
in private practice and and I am sorry about that and I wish I could say you know there's a magic wand for that but there isn't just hammering at the system is all I can think of to do people need to make time people need to fund Actually, the time it, yeah uh, that is it for questions. So thank you again, Dr. Robinson. Really appreciate it. And thank you for all who attended. Um, looking yes, forward to March. <laughs> all right. Have a great night. You too. Thanks, Shannon. Bye-bye.